Hi, this is Shannon from No Shelf Control. Thanks for joining me on the channel again today. We are down to the last two books in the semifinals. Um, and the this book and the book that went through yesterday, uh, which was the Book of Goose, will compete against two zombie books. Uh, those are books that were initially voted out, but will be brought back by vote from the judges um, to compete against the two semifinal books. So whoever wins today and the Book of Goose will compete either tomorrow or Thursday against a zombie book, and we will have our final two books go head to head on Friday in the Tournament of Books. So it's getting pretty exciting. Um, I'm ready to go today. I hope you are too. Today we have Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel versus The Rabbit Hutch by Tess Gunty. Now, if you've been following along, I know you've heard about these books, but I'm gonna go ahead and review them a little bit just for folks who haven't um, seen the previous videos. If you wanna check out those videos and see where these books came from, who they competed against in the previous rounds, check out my description. Um, those videos are down below. Otherwise, follow along today and you will find out who today's winner is. So let's switch it up a little bit today and talk about the judge first. Her name is Torsa Gosal. She uses she, her pronouns, and she is the author of a book of literary criticism called Out of Mind and an experimental novella called Open Couplets. Her fiction, essays, and other writing appear in Berkeley Fiction Review, the Massachusetts Review, Catapult, Los Angeles Review of Books, Literary Hub, Bustle, and elsewhere. She's an assistant professor of English at California State University, Sacramento, and a host of the Narrative for Social Justice podcast. So that is Torsa Gosal, and she will be our judge today. Now I will tell you, she's all over the place as far as back and forth um, in what she wrote about the two books. So I'm gonna have to piece things together a little bit. She doesn't talk about one book and then the other and then her judgment. She sort of hops back and forth. So I'm reading her judgment in the order that I think is appropriate, but um, we'll get through all of it. It just isn't necessarily in the order that she wrote it because it doesn't flow in the way that I do these videos. So I'm reserving the right to switch it up a little bit. Let's talk about what the two books are. So Sea of Tranquility, Emily St. John Mandel, uh, published May 5th, 2022 by Knopf, and it's 272 pages. Here's the synopsis for that one. The award-winning best-selling author of Station Eleven and the Glass Hotel returns with a novel of art, time travel, love, and plague that takes the reader from Vancouver Island in 1912 to a dark colony on the moon 500 years later, unfurling a story of humanity across centuries and space. Edwin St. Andrew is 18 years old when he crosses the Atlantic by steamship, exiled from polite society following an ill-conceived diatribe at a dinner party. He enters the forest, spellbound by the beauty of the Canadian wilderness, and suddenly hears the notes of a violin echoing in an airship terminal, an experience that shocks him to the core. Two centuries later, a famous writer named Olive Llewellyn is on a book tour. She's traveling all over Earth, but her home is the second moon colony, a place of white stone, spired towers, and artificial beauty. Within the text of Olive's best-selling pandemic novel lines, lies a strange passage. A man plays his violin for change in the echoing corridor of an airship terminal as the trees of a forest rise around him. When Gaspary Jacques Roberts, a detective in the black-skied Night City, is hired to investigate an anomaly in the North American wilderness, he uncovers a series of lives upended. The exiled son of an earl driven to madness, a writer trapped far from home as a pandemic ravages Earth, and a childhood friend from the Night City who, like Gaspary himself, has glimpsed the chance to do something extraordinary, that will disrupt the timeline of the universe. A virtuoso performance that is as human and tender as it is intellectually playful, Sea of Tranquility is a novel of time travel and metaphysics that precisely captures the reality of our current moment. So there are a lot of characters discussed there. Um, I think I said last time, I'm not sure who the protagonist is, um, but we will see as we go further along here. Two things I saw in the synopsis this time. One is Edwin St. Andrew was exiled from polite society following an ill-conceived diatribe at a dinner party. 
wow, he, he went off at a dinner party and he was exiled from polite society? That could happen to me. <laughs> so that just seemed extreme to me. And then the other thing that I saw was um, he enters the forest and suddenly hears the notes of a violin echoing in an airship terminal, an experience that shocks him to his core. Why is somebody playing a violin in an airship terminal, an experience that shocks him to his core? I'm not sure I get that either. Um, so we'll see. But those were the two things that jumped out of the synopsis for me today. And I thought I would mention them just a little bit as we talk about the books. Let's talk next about The Rabbit Hutch. That is by Tess Gunty, as you know, published August 2nd, 2022, also by Knopf. So this is a head-to-head -head Knopf versus Knopf, um, 352 pages. And The Rabbit Hutch, the synopsis says this. The automobile industry has abandoned Vacavale, Indiana, leaving the residents behind too. In a rundown apartment building on the edge of town, commonly known as the Rabbit Hutch, a number of people now reside quietly, looking for ways to live in a dying city. Apartment C2 is lonely and detached. C6 is aging and stuck. C8 harbors an extraordinary fear, but C4 is of particular interest. Here live four teenagers who have recently aged out of the state foster care system, three boys and one girl, Blandine. Hauntingly beautiful and unnervingly bright, Blandine is plagued by the structures, people, and places that not only failed her, but actively harmed her. Now all Blandine wants is an escape, a true bodily escape like the mystics describe in the books she reads. Set across one week and culminating in a shocking act of violence, the Rabbit Hutch chronicles a town on the brink, desperate for rebirth. How far will its residents, especially Blandine, go to achieve it? Does one person's gain always come at another's expense? Tess Gunty's The Rabbit Hutch is a gorgeous and provocative tale of loneliness and community, entrapment and freedom. It announces a major new voice in American fiction, one bristling with intelligence and vulnerability. So a couple of things here. I don't think that I've talked about the fact that this is a debut, that Tess Gunty hasn't written anything before this that we know of, that's something that's been popularly published. Um, and so that's a big deal. You know, not only is she a Notre Dame woman, which I support, um, but this is a debut and I can certainly get behind that. Um, the other thing that I noticed in the synopsis this time is set across one week. I don't think I realized when I read this book that it happens in that short of a time frame, that it's just one week that all of these things happen. It makes sense now that I think about it, um, but I hadn't really thought about the compressed time frame that she's writing about. So I think that's very interesting. So let's talk about what our judge has to say um, in introduction to her judgment. So she says, Emily St. John Mandel's Sea of Tranquility and Tess Gunty's The Rabbit Hutch are novels of immense scope that stand at a decisive remove from narrowly conceived collages of modern life, the kind of contemporary novels Joyce Carol Oates calls wan little husks and Arundhati Roy labels domesticated like products. So that is all she says in her introduction. Um, that was a lot. So she talks about the fact that both books have immense scope. I do believe that. I've read The Rabbit Hutch and it does have an immense scope. Again, I go back to the fact that it takes place over one week. That's pretty impressive. Um, so I guess The Sea of Tranquility with all of those characters also has a pretty large scope. So we have uh, the next thing that Torsa Gosal talks about is the Sea of Tranquility itself. So this is part of what she has written about the Sea of Tranquility. She says, Sea of Tranquility opens with the deceptively simple account of Edwin, a gloomy Englishman crossing the Atlantic to reach Canada in 1912. Edwin was forced to leave England sooner than expected by his parents, both Raj babies, after he made a few, rather meek, I must add, anti-colonial remarks at a dinner party. The opening is more historical drama than speculative fiction, with Mandel shrewdly screening from view the narrative's century-spanning timeline, the character ensemble, and their array of perspectives. Then she says, both Sea of Tranquility and the Rabbit Hutch made me think of those rare group photos that managed to exude something of the feverish energy of the party without freezing individual subjects into a tired pose. 
Their use of multiple points of view and variegated narration returned me to Mikhail Bakhtin's conception of the novel as a literary genre that is always in the making, in direct contact with developing reality, a genre that includes a diversity of social speech types and voices to form a structured artistic system. To me, the idea of the novel as an artistic system implies a range of relations among characters, the time and space in which they are located, and the unfolding events. Faced with the task of choosing a favorite between the novels, I kept asking myself which of them works better as an artistic system. That is to say, I focused on how the several relations set up in a narrative world interact with one another and meaning emerges from them. In Sea of Tranquility, we follow Edwin as he finds his way in the Canadian West. He is enchanted by the surrounding wilderness until he has a strange experience in a forest. His experience is vaguely outlined with sparse sensory details, sudden blindness or an eclipse, notes of violin music. Feels like being in some vast interior, something like a train station or a cathedral. Before Edwin or I, the reader, can make meaning of the experience, the narrative hops a century and I am plunged to the middle of Morella Kessler's life where snatches of the eerie phenomenon in the forest returns, though there is no conspicuous trace of Edwin here. A best-selling pandemic novel in the 23rd century written by Olive Llewellyn, an author hailing from the second lunar colony, describes the same strange vision in the forest, but its fullest implications are not evident to Olive. Through these interconnected fragments, Sea of Tranquility tackles a plethora of ideas. The nature of time, technology, bureaucracy, crisis, colonialism. However, at the heart of it all is a moral dilemma having to do with the possibilities of human connection and agency. This dilemma is eminent in the narrative from the outset, but it became conspicuous to me only gradually after I started to see how specific events involving distinct characters are related. I also admired that even as the narrative leaps over centuries, it lingers on moments of tenderness and longing, such as when Morella realizes she misunderstood her friend Vincent, but has run out of time to make amends. Then she moves on to the rabbit hutch. I have to say that what Torsa Gosal says here is a little bit over my head, or at least feels that way. She's talking about books and how they function as a system. I'm not sure I know what that means. Um, we did a couple of things. We did sort of discover that Edwin is likely the protagonist. Um, so that she cleared that up for me. Um, she also talks about why he was excommunicated um, and also why the um, vision that he had in the forest was so overwhelming to him. It wasn't necessarily just someone playing a violin in an airship terminal. It was this experience of that that may not have actually been happening, but he felt and perceived. Um, so I don't know if I'm sophisticated enough to fully understand Torsa Gosal's um, review of The Sea of Tranquility, but we will keep going with the rabbit hutch and see how I do and how you do with the rest of it. So I'm going to go back to a paragraph that Torsa Gosal writes about the rabbit hutch earlier in her uh, review, and here's what she says. The rabbit hutch, on the other hand, signals its interest in multitudinous lives from the start. The first sentence introduces us to Blandine Watkins, a girl who was aged out of the foster care system just as she exits her body. And while Blandine exits her body, a moment and image the narrative circles, she seems to be transfiguring into many people, every tenant of her apartment building, and many things, a pair of red glasses, an algorithm, a pair of tap shoes, and the list goes on. The splitting and proliferating of subjectivity are experiences she desires. For Blandine, individualism is the opposite of ethical life. The Rabbit Hutch is set in a post-industrial wasteland, the fictional town of Vacavale, Indiana, that was once home to Zorn automobiles and has now fallen into economic ruin. In this dilapidated town, Blandine lives in a rundown apartment with three boys. The narrative dips us into not only Blandine's consciousness, but also those of her roommates, the other tenants of the apartment building, as well as an erstwhile television star and her son. I have to admit here that I am a reader who is generally very fond of this sort of psychological narration. Few narrative elements engage me more than machinations and gymnastics of fictional minds. All the characters in the rabbit hutch are sketched with quirky and sometimes amusing specificity, which I thoroughly savored. 
Blandine is obsessed with female mystics. A mother living in apartment C8 of the building has a phobia of her baby's eyes. The television star takes a peculiar interest in pygmy sloths, and a Vacavale developer is a jazzily dressed swamp monster willing to plunder his own home to eat. Gunty also uses a range of narrative techniques. There are diagrams, obituaries, and letters. At the sentence level, Gunty is a stunning writer who names the ordinary and the extraordinary in the same breath. If life is sacred and worthy, then every life counts. Blandine's life, the life of a fish, a goat, a cottontail rabbit, all of it. Looking at a dying fish, Jack, one of Blandine's roommates, feels as though the creature witnessed him. It taught him something about his soul. But despite the interest in the sanctity of souls, the writing is most striking when it offers wry observations about living in an unjust society loosely tethered to context. For example, while visiting a wealthy household, Blandine finds the effects of bewitching real estate on her body deeply troubling, as she is unable to reconcile it with her budding ideologies about private property. The mother in C8 thinks the plot of contemporary life can be summarized as everyone punishing each other for things they didn't do. Then there's commentary about social media, everybody influencing, everybody under the influence, everybody staring at their own godforsaken profile, searching for proof that they're lovable. The convergence of the various narrative arcs in the rabbit hutch is foreshadowed from the first chapter when Blandine is said to take on the essence of everyone and everything around her. The novel also repeatedly uses the opening episode, Blandine exiting her body as a signpost. However, when it all comes together, it does not quite feel like a culmination. The artistic system does not seem to be striving toward meaning or purpose that is greater than the parts constituting it. The lure and strength of the rabbit hutch is voice, how it exploits the possibilities of language, not the complex interaction among events that make up the plot. So a couple of things there. Again, very academic, very intelligent. Um, I admire uh, her ability to think and to parse out these novels, but I'm not sure I'm up to the game. So um, I will say that I it never occurred to me that when Blandine is being harmed in her apartment and exits her body, that she actually takes on the form of all of the people in these different apartments and all of the people and things that we meet throughout the story. That just, I missed that altogether. So Torsa Gosal mentions that twice here in her review and it went straight over my head. So if that is part of why we got into the minds of all of those characters and heard all of those stories, I really didn't didn't grasp that. I definitely do agree with Gosal about the vividness of Gunty's characters and the way she writes dialogue, the things that um, some of the characters say and some of the sentences that she comes up with outside of dialogue that are very memorable and poignant. So um, I definitely appreciated that perspective from Gosal. I really would love to see who Gosal is going to pick here. So I think we should talk about her judgment. She says, Sea of Tranquility is relatively more direct, even plain in its use of language, but the artistic organization of seemingly ordinary events produces dramatic effects. The novel's lure has nothing to do with Mandel's meticulous plotting. The fictional author figure, Olive, is criticized by her readers for not tying loose ends in her best-selling novel. Quite self-consciously, Mandel goes to another extreme. She exploits both chance and causality to tightly knit the various narrative strands. However, I found it refreshing that the chain of connected events does not extol an individual's ability to change the world, overturning a popular assumption about plot and causality in the global north. The plot discloses how the world itself limits agency. A character who seemed to have been spared death because of another character's intervention dies anyway within a few days. Sea of Tranquility is unabashed in its commitment to a unity of action, thoroughly open to exposing its own intentional design. Reading the novel is a reminder that plot can theatrically elevate splintered experiences to conjure up a finer order of things, and that the semblance of order is captivating, even if it must ultimately shatter. So she chose The Sea of Tranquility, Emily St. John Mandel. 
um, which I'm not surprised after she mentioned that uh, the rabbit hutch didn't necessarily meet her criteria as a system. She says the artistic system does not seem to be striving toward meaning or purpose that is greater than the parts constituting it. Um, I had a feeling she was going for Sea of Tranquility. I have to admit the last paragraph that she wrote about Sea of Tranquility and why she chose it I don't totally understand. So it says it's unabashed in its commitment to a unity of action, thoroughly open to exposing its own intentional design. Not sure. So, and then reading the novel is a reminder that plot can theatrically elevate splintered experiences to conjure up a finer order of things and that the semblance of order is captivating even if it must ultimately shatter. So I value that she chose the Sea of Tranquility. I am not sure that I am sophisticated enough to completely understand why she chose it. But I'm providing this information to you. I hope that it is valuable to you and that you look at it and go, oh, yeah, absolutely. That's that's exactly why she chose Sea of Tranquility. So that is what Torsa Gosal has to say about Sea of Tranquility today and her judgment between the two books. I will be back tomorrow. Tomorrow we will find out who the Book of Goose is going to go against as its zombie pick. So we will have a surprise uh, in the competitor. We don't know yet who the zombie choice was to go against the Book of Goose. We also don't know who the zombie choice is to go against Sea of Tranquility. It could be the rabbit hutch. We don't know. Um, could be tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, which is another one that I saw get knocked out that I was surprised about. It could also be uh, notes on your sudden disappearance. We shall see. It could be any of the ones back to the beginning, but we'll have two zombie matches Thursday and no Wednesday and Thursday, and then the final match will take place on Friday. So I am really looking forward to that. Um, I have enjoyed every single one of these rounds, and I hope that you have too. Um, it's been a fun thing to have to come back every day and talk to you about. If you're enjoying it, please click the like and subscribe buttons. That helps me a great deal. Um, I'll mention that I do have a registry, a wish list at the bottom of my uh, video descriptions. If you're so inclined and would like to gift me a book, I will absolutely read it, review it, and make sure you get a shout out on the channel. Okay, so I will be back tomorrow with the zombie round um, prior to the final on Friday. I can't wait to tell you all about it, and I hope you'll join me again soon. Take care. Bye.